Yeah, can you hear me, my friends? All right.
You should okay. test it, have it yep. tested. Right. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, you can. Good, good, good. Come closer, come closer. We are not biting. We are trying to start. We have a long, big, interesting program. <laughs> Should not laugh with them. I do both. Have you checked? How do you check it in lead? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Max, have you checked the Svan's sound? Is it on? I can't hear him. Check? Checking, checking. Hi. Something I. Phone inside there as well. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Are you ready for the? Interesting five days of DHSU annual conference in this beautiful weather. We just ordered it for you guys, not necessarily what we are used to, summer in Norway, Oslo. So we are starting with um, introducing the of this conference. And of course, the opening I think this is not good now. Not at all. No. Okay, but then I'm introducing Svein Stern. He's our rector, so he will do the opening speech for you all. Welcome, Svein. Uh -huh. What is this? What are we managing without? Can you hear me? No, no cannot. You need it because we have Zoom and stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so maybe using this one. What is this? No testing. Svein, you can hold one. Well, eh? That one is cool, but it's not so cool. Shall I use this one? Yeah. 
Test, test. That's better. So there, Kristin, their friends, colleagues, welcome to Norway, welcome to Oslo, and welcome to University of Oslo. It's a great pleasure to be here. And it's a great pleasure also to be allowed to open this conference because we are extremely proud of the work that has been done by Kristin, all colleagues, and the whole network that you are representing here. So it's really a great pleasure to be here. Welcome to those of you are that are here physically. Welcome to those that are present digitally. And uh, again, it is great to be here. This is, I would say, academia at its best. And that is needed in these days because there are uncertain times. I think that the geopolitics chose shadow over society, also over academia. If you look to G7 and EU to an increasing degree, they try to work in partnership with what they call trusted partners. And I think it's quite dangerous to think like that because we still need to work on the sustainable development agenda, of course, and goal number 17, partnerships for sustainability is extremely important. And what we need is what Christine and the DHISP has managed to do over years. We need long-term commitment, we need equitable partnerships, and we need to have sharing and partnering joint as, how to say, guiding principles for what we are doing. And I think Alpha Ba in the annual report had a very nice uh, description of what is going on in, 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 in HISP and in the DHISP because he says that he was asked to drive this process. He said, we are here to participate with you. That was the response of uh, the Oslo people. And you tell us what you want to do. And I think this is so extremely important. It's a different way to collaborate than some of other type of international partnerships. Local ownership is important. It's about empowerment. It's about um, capacity building, of course. And I think that his to some extent, tick all the boxes, open science, citizen engagement, and so on. And it is an example of how to do global north-south cooperation. We have been inspired by this at the University of Oslo also. We are learning from what you are doing. Last six years, we have been working through an organization called the Guild of Research in European Research Intensive Universities in order to develop a new model for collaboration with African institutions. So we have tried to collaborations, and we have to develop the collaboration. There might be, I am. And what we have tried to do is to commit to long-term equitable type of partnerships, where at least universities in two different African countries collaborate with at least two different. In Africa, universities in two different European countries. Collaborate with two universities in Europe. And we are really eager that these alliances Également, are embedded. On Thursday, we decided the establishment of 20 long term centers of excellence. Centres d'excellence. We are in that for 10 terme, years and we put in a basis for this in order to have long term equitable type of partnership. We try to build a pair of infrastructure and also institutions. The partnership, the institutions, entre autres. <laughs> but if I don't disturb, uh, if it doesn't disturb you too much, I will continue anyway. Okay. I think that the annual report is both inspiring and impressing. And that is needed at a time where we have a government in Norway that seems not to understand really the value of international cooperation in research and higher education. It is important for the global us, but it's also important for Norway, for society, for our students. And that's extremely important that we continue to work together. Uh, we live in a time where we need to build trust, mutual understanding. We need more international cooperation, not less 
international cooperation and you are guiding stars for the University of Oslo. We are very proud to have you here. We are very proud of the program. Welcome and enjoy the conference. I'm sure you're going to have both fun and do really good work for us, the big us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you are you are allowed to run. You are allowed to run and bring your uh, the HS2 uh, coffee cup with you and the caps. <laughs> See you later. So thank you so much, Svein, for for reminding us of uh, of how important it is at the university to actually have all these legs to stand on, which is uh, hand, um, handling social challenges, doing capacity building, and doing innovations. So for this um, annual conference topic for this year is sharing innovation across the sectors. And we are, last year we had the um, global progress, no, glo innovation for global progress. But now we're taking it even further because what we have learned of uh, handling, working hard, revamping all the, our resources to accelerate whatever we can do to support countries during the pandemic we have learned that that um, health information systems is not only about health when it's come to handling a pandemic we need to go across all the sectors to handle immigration citizen registries schools uh, safely reopening of schools that they did in uganda so these are all many sectors that need to be involved. So that's why we, we wanted to, to have the topic of this conference to kind of a bit celebrating what we have achieved, but also looking a bit into the future to see that supporting government in the global south, and it should be in the global north as well. We have the same problems here of a lack of integration, interoperability, and uh, govern governance of data. So that's why we are calling this uh, um, call for both abstract presentations, discussions, plans, future plans for sharing innovation across sectors. So you will see there will be several um, events happening on that one. It will be a closing parallel no, a plenary on Thursday before the the, the big event that we do here in the annual conference always celebrating each other uh, in a social event in the beautiful weather on the lake very close from here. But we will have parallel sessions throughout the, the conference. But still, we shouldn't forget what we actually have been achieving uh, during uh, the pandemic that we have been able not only to mobilize resources, but also to work together and more than ever being able to share the innovations, the capacities, the good cases, the bad cases or practices so we could help each other in order to support countries. So that's what it's all about is how can we develop capacity to support countries for digital public infrastructure. Then is denoting a bit on the access to becoming a global good, a digital global public good that can be utilized if the cap capacity is in the country, it can be utilized for many things. So that is what we are working on. And we will also have a, a session on a digital global public good. What does it take to be a global good? What does it take to build capacity so we can uh, innovate, support countries, support ministries across, not only health, but education. Svein was talking about Alpha Bar, that he's actually, um, uh, working in the AMS team in the Ministry of, uh, of Education in the Gambia. So education is also a very vibrant now, new community within the DHS2 umbrella, his umbrella. And we will have also um, several sessions where we will discuss also how can we uh, thinking about um, combining resources, combining data and knowledge about the claim climate in order to see how that can have impact on health how can we actually utilize the the, um, the knowledge of data governance data analytics in order to be able to predict intervene 
do interventions on health issues as well. Uh, that's a new avenue that we will start. We don't know how much activities there will be, but we will definitely start it. And that will also be a parallel session on Wednesday. So if you if you don't know what's happening uh, in this conference, you download the app, but Max will tell more about that one. So there is so many, many things happening and we are breaking uh, records every year. That's the that's the tradition. And we are have 400 registered this time. Last year it was 300. So what it will be next year, we don't know. We are starting new uh, traditions all the time, as I mentioned. We have, um, last year we, we announced that we become a center. He's become a center at the University of Oslo. Now we are also making an annual report, which a proper center need to do. So if you if you look at the desk, there, there is a red thing over there. You are you can take it. We didn't put it into your bag because we were afraid you would throw it away in garbage somewhere. But if you want it, you are we are very happy that you can take it and read it. And as um, Swine uh, quoted, we have interviews with people that in a way showcase our way of working, our, how, why we are different. People are asking us, you are a global public good, you were able to mobilize all these resources during pandemic, so you were able to support 60 over countries when it came to disease surveillance, contact tracing and vaccine delivery. So what is the secret recipe or what do you have in that soup? That is what we are trying to, to showcase in this annual report through these interviews of several different actors and of course also bragging a bit about other stuff we are doing so you are most welcome to to grab one and uh, there will also be an, an uh, a pdf of course because we are thinking about the climate so we don't print if you don't people really want it and hold it in their hands so it can be, so it can be downloaded from our website the pdf if you would like to to share it with others so this will be a new tradition that we will do other years. So if you have any ideas during the year for what to be showcased in this report, please tell us. So this, um, with these words, I really think we should go into a bit more uh, logistics. We have uh, many things happening from the plenary scene here. And um, uh, we will just go through a bit of uh, who's here, what will happen this week. And then we will hear from all the product managers what all the new features, what all the things that we can um, share, implement, deploy in the coming year. And all these news will be presented by the team of product managers that are sitting here in the front. But first we will go through, who are we? Who are we this year? And we know that we have all time high um, uh, contingency from ministries. And many, many countries are actually coming with many ministries. We have, we don't know whether everyone is here already, but for instance, Malawi has, are here with three ministries, agriculture, health, and the gender and social welfare. We actually have a gender uh, equity, not gender, but an equity session as well this year. That, uh, that is actually the first time. Okay, Ola. Thank you, Kineste. Is this working? Can you hear me? Perfect. Good morning and welcome everyone. As Kristen said, we'll move into some of the logistics, some of the information to guide you through this week. We will, um, as you can see around you, there's a lot of people. Um, so we won't have time for everyone to introduce themselves, but I'll try to help um, giving you some statistics on who is here. And I'll start with that. And then I'll pass it over to Max to go through some more logistics around the agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do this. So as Kristen said, another record this year, uh, 414 um, at least registered, confirmed and paid. I was counting the badges out there on the tables. I don't think we are 414 inside yet, but there may be people stuck in uh, down at the central station. Unfortunately, I think also a few are stuck with VFS and our embassies dealing with visa applications. But uh, it's great to have so many people here. 
Uh, we also have, of course, a big team uh, from our own staff uh, here in Oslo around Europe, but there are at least 342 guests from outside the, the UIO and the HISP Center representing 72 different countries, which is actually the same as last year, as you can see on the left. But there are many more organizations this year. I counted 169 unique organizations represented at this conference. And of course, we shouldn't forget the people online. There are more than 800 registered uh, to follow the sessions on Zoom. So big numbers. If you look at the distribution uh, by country of residence, um, I think throughout this, when I was working on these statistics, I think there are, of course, some challenges with the data quality here as well. Um, um, it's not all cleaned up and, and not everyone are confirmed. And I think there are a little bit of confusion of country residence versus where you were born. But but anyway, I think it's a, you can see the spread from, from west to east and south to north, uh, quite incredible. Uh, Africa again leading in terms of number of countries that are here. Um, I'm very glad to see a lot of Central African countries um, coming here to Oslo with, with big teams this year. Also, uh, four countries from the Lusophone Africa here. Bang Wing, the window, I would say. Uh, great to have so many here. I think also we see that, uh, just like last year, the MENA Arab region is really picking up on DHS too. There's a big team here from ministries in Jordan, Yemen, Iraq, and Pakistan. And a lot of WHO staff from country offices and the regional office uh, in EMRO as well. And, and a small team from Latin America uh, doesn't really reflect the big uptake in that region, but maybe reflecting the, the lack of aid budgets for travels. And also it's a far, it's a long travel from, from Latin America. But we have a team from Panama and, and uh, colleagues from Colombia here. Uh, welcome to you all. If you look at uh, the, how many people we have per team here, uh, of course, the home team from, from Norway uh, leading, uh, again, with a big team from the US, uh, but great to see so many people from Malawi, UK, Pakistan, Uganda, Somalia, Switzerland, uh, Ethiopia, you see there are big, big teams here. Um, and if you look on the, on the pie chart on the right, it's a good mix of, of uh, different types of groups and organizations represented with but one fourth uh, representing country governments, mainly Ministry of Health. We have a few other ministries, like Kristin said, uh, education, agriculture, uh, and gender equality. And then uh, about 20% from NGOs, another 20 something percent from international organizations. Uh, and then uh, of course, with a, with a big team from the HISP Center, University of Oslo, we have quite a big group from academia universities, but also other universities uh, coming here to Oslo. And then there's a fair share of private companies and consultants as well. So I think it's a good mix. It's great to have so many people with different uh, backgrounds and also different kind of uh, roles within the DHS implementation coming here and sharing experiences. Okay, so I think um, we'll take a little bit of extra time to introduce the Ministry of Health and, and other kind of government teams that are here. Um, I did see some of these uh, countries on the badges out there, unfortunately, but uh, so some may be stuck in the applica visa application process. Um, but let's call, uh, I'll call you out one team at a time, and then you can stand up and we can welcome you together. Uh, so let's see, do we have anyone from Angola here? Minister of Health, Angola, can you stand up please? Welcome. A big team. Great, thank window. Okay, then Bangladesh, do we have anyone from Bangladesh comment? Welcome. And Botswana. Yes, welcome. Burundi. Not yet, yet. Chad, do we have Chad? Despite uh, unwelcoming VFS processes and embassies, uh, you, you should believe that all of us here, we welcome you with all our hearts. You are very much welcome to, to Norway. Unfortunately, it's a complicated visa process to get here. Let's hear from, uh, do you have any from Congo? This is the Democratic Republic, I believe, Congo. 
I think we have a big team from WHO. We can do them later, but uh, no one from ministry yet. Okay. East Timor. Yes, welcome. Should also be a team here from Ethiopia. Yes, welcome. Many. Welcome. Anyone from Ghana? Ghana Health Service. Did you make it? No, not yet. Okay. Guinea Bissau. Not yet. Iraq. Yes, welcome. And Jordan. Yes, welcome. And then I think uh, for the first time, Minister of Health from Kyrgyzstan. Welcome. Great to have you here. I know the region where DHS is really picking up. Uh, Madagascar, anyone from Ministry of Health, Madagascar here? Yes. And then as we heard, there are three ministries represented from Malawi. So if you can all stand up, welcome to Malawi. Great, anyone from Mali? Not yet, no. Then Mozambique. Welcome. We have a very exciting plenary session on Wednesday morning where the Mozambique team will uh, share their story of DHS implementation over more than 10 years. Uh, anyone from Nigeria, Ministry of Health or Education, maybe? No, not yet. Particularly difficult visa process in Nigeria. Trust me, we've been on the call with the embassy in Accra for many weeks now. Pakistan, anyone from Ministry of Health in Pakistan? Yes, welcome. And then we have a small team from Panama. Do we have uh, Panama here? Welcome. I think that's also a first. We have Ministry of Health from Panama here. Great. And then Rwanda. Yes, welcome Andrew. And then Sao Tome and Principe, anyone here? No, that's good. And then Somalia, I think both education and health from Somalia are here. Yes, welcome. Uh, Sri Lanka, yes, welcome. Tanzania, yes, welcome. Minister of Health or Education from Togo. Yes, welcome. We should have a team from Uganda, Minister of Health as well. Yes, welcome. And Yemen, Yemen Minister, welcome. Yeah. And then someone is whispering in my ear that we have representatives from Ukraine as well. Is that true? Ukraine ministry. Yeah, welcome. Great to have you here. And then maybe are there other countries that didn't make it through my cleaning of statistics list? So if there are other countries and governments here, please uh, you can stand up and you can speak and tell us where you're from. Yes, Burkina Faso, welcome. Great. Cote d'Ivoire, bienvenue. Who else did we miss? Great. Okay, we have of course uh, other organizations here as well. Uh, this one is showing you kind of how many these are the biggest teams. If we kind of remove the University of Oslo and all the HISP groups, um, we have a big delegation from WHO here. For simplicity, I've merged headquarters and country offices for some of these groups that, uh, of course, come from different countries. But maybe we can start with WHO. Everyone representing WHO, stand up, please. See, I think it should be a big, big team. 
वेलकम आई नो वी हैव रीड regional teams from both Afro uh, Brazzaville and also from the Emre office and many country offices. And of course the Geneva headquarters are represented as well. And then uh, let's go through this quickly then. FHI 360, are you here? Welcome. And MSF, yes, welcome. UNICEF, welcome. And uh, CDC, welcome. Simprints, welcome. Mercy Corps from Pakistan team, yes, welcome. ICF, welcome. BO. And then we have uh, Vaho from ECOWAS. Welcome, bienvenue. And JSI is also here. Not yet, there you are. <laughs> Sight savers, welcome. Samaritan's Purse, welcome. And then USAID, I think at least a few country offices, welcome. Apps Associates. Fact Zimbabwe, welcome. Uh, we have a small team from Gavi, welcome. And then uh, if you look at the map, uh, far bottom right, uh, New Zealand, opposite of Norway. Someone has traveled really far. There's a team from M Supply in New Zealand here. Welcome. <laughs> and then uh, from our neighbors in Finland, Nuovo Nordic Healthcare Services. Are they here? Not yet. Maybe later this week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a team from Akirere School of Public Health in Kampala, Uganda. Are they here? Mets team? No, not yet. Okay. And then Kristin pointed out to me that there should be a team from RTSL, Result to Save Lives here. Yeah, Daniel, welcome. Yeah, and there were further, there were 169. So these were the ones with kind of three and more members, but you're all very, very welcome, of course. Uh, great to have you here. And then uh, Maxwell, we changed the agenda app this year. So Maxwell uh, tried to guide you through so that you can find your way to all the interesting sessions. So I'll hand it over to Max, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Ola. Uh, so as you might've seen, we have a, a new annual conference website this year, and here's the uh, address at the top, dac2023.dhs2.org. Uh, so anytime you're wondering what's happening next in the conference, you can go there and look at the agenda tab, and you should be able to navigate per day and see what's coming up. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Max. I run the training and communications group at the University of Oslo DHS2 project, and uh, my team's responsible for putting on this conference. So if you have, Thank you. Um, especially Alice, who uh, I'm sure you all know. Uh, so if you have any questions about the conference, she's the real one to ask. I'm just the figurehead. Um, okay. So when you go to the website, one thing you can also do is uh, look at who the participants are. So this is a mixture of in-person and uh, online participants. And there's a good place to find out who's participating, maybe make contacts, get in touch with people. Uh, it's voluntary to add your contact information there. So if you'd like people to contact you, you can go in and update your profile to have your email address or LinkedIn or uh, whatever you like, your photo too, if you want. Um, and we will have a number of coffee breaks, tea breaks, lunch breaks throughout the event. And that's a good time to just mingle uh, and connect with people. And also, like I said, you can connect with people online too. Uh, for the agenda, it's a four-day agenda. Here's what it looks like when you look at our website. So you can see we have time, we have the name of the event. If there's interpretation into French, that's indicated in the title. Um, and when you open them, you'll find links to access them online if you're joining us virtually. Uh, if you're here in person and would prefer to listen to French rather than English, uh, you can also log in via Zoom, and that's where you access the live interpretation. We'll have a slide on that in just a few seconds. Um, 
you can see here, typically we're starting off with these large plenary sessions in the morning. Usually it's the whole morning. Uh, I think on Wednesday, it's only until 1030. And then we split up into parallel sessions and we'll show a map and a couple of slides of where those are. But when we get to the parallel sessions, you have four different tracks to choose from typically. So it's good to look at the schedule and see what's coming up, uh, see what you're interested in. Um, there will also be printed schedules available on the doors to the parallel session rooms. So if you're not sure, you can double check there. And it's important to also realize that each of those rooms does have a limited physical capacity. So if you get to a room and it's full, um, then you have the option of either going to check out a different session that's happening in a different room or joining that session online because those will also be on Zoom. So if you really can't get into the physical meeting room, you can still participate in that meeting virtually or watch a recording of it later because they all will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel at the end of the conference. Um, we did want to say thank you to everyone who sent in abstracts. We had 191 of them, which is a record this year. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, especially all of you here. And um, there are a total of 175 speakers who will be speaking at the conference uh, across a total of 55 sessions. Again, a uh, plug for getting up early to come join us in the plenaries. Those are some of the most exciting sessions. Uh, we're starting at 8.30 in the morning tomorrow. So hopefully we'll see you here bright and early. We will have plenty of coffee. So there's no excuse for, for being too tired to come in. Um, and this is what the app looks like. So if you uh, like to use your mobile phone to access um, websites, you can also download the conference app, uh, which is helpfully linked to from the main uh, page of our website. So if you go again to dac2023.dhs2.org and scroll down, you'll see a banner that has information about that app, and you can download it directly from there onto Android or iPhone. Uh, in that session, you'll see a different display of the conference agenda. A lot of the same features as the website, just in a more mobile friendly uh, format. And you can also customize your agenda. So if you know there are certain sessions you definitely want to go to, you can save those and view your own sort of customized agenda so you don't need to look through the whole thing every time. Uh, and if you have any questions about this, again, let us know. Um, and you do need a to be a registered participant for the conference to get access to it and personalize it through this app. So if you have any issues logging in, again, just send us an email. You should all have the access to the Oslo 2023 email address to contact us. All right, so this afternoon we have a special event and Ola is gonna to explain to us how this is gonna work. This is our use case bazaar. Can you still hear me? Yeah, it says low bat, but I'll try a little bit. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so as always, we'll do a use case bazaar. We've had many, many abstract submissions. Some of them uh, have been turned into a poster, polo poster. Uh, we have 23 posters and, and teams presenting at the use case bazaar this afternoon. Um, so you will, uh, I think it's better to start with, so you kind of get the idea. I think you, we will have, uh, just like we did last day for those that attended, when we walk over to the other building where we'll do the parallel breakout sessions, we'll have one uh, set of posters inside uh, the big lobby area there, and then we'll have another uh, group of posters outside between here and, and that building. So um, the trick is to, to read the information either in the app agenda app or on this printed uh, i think there are many printed versions of this you can see the numbers here all the all the different posters what they're about who's presenting and then you can find their location so we'll go on for about two and a half hours um the poor presenters will do it up to 15 times they will do like 10 minutes uh, pitches and then you'll have time to, to ask questions and have discussions in smaller groups. And then we'll uh, do a signal and then everyone will start again. So then you can move to another poster. Um, for those that have been with us many years, you know that in the, when we had a bit fewer sessions, we try to put you in groups and you walk around in kind of a very systematic way. I think we've given up on that now. and. Uh, We'll let you choose where to go, uh, but we'll restart every 10, 15 minutes uh, so that you have a chance to listen to many of the presenters. I think it's a, it's a great way to, to hear what countries and other organizations are doing with DJS2. It's a good mix of both very technical and also more kind of implementation uh, specific presentations and a lot of interoperability I saw this year. So uh, Bob will be busy uh, learning from you all so I think uh, this one you will figure out. It's not much more to say. Uh, we will, this bazaar will be followed by a social event uh, that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Thank you. 
Okay, so as Olaf mentioned, right after the use case bazaar, we will transition into a social event. There'll be pizza and drinks, and that will be over in the same location where the use case bazaar is, which is right across the patio area outside of this conference hall. Uh, during that event, a couple of colleagues and I will be standing around with a video camera looking for people to talk to us about your impressions of DHS2. Uh, we did this last year and it was a lot of fun, and I think we got some really great and inspiring uh, stories from people. And um, really, we don't want to make this seem too complicated. We have one question we want to ask you, which is, what does DHS2 mean to you? And you can talk for as little or as long as you like. Um, it's really up to you what you say. But if you're interested in that, we'll be standing over along the wall across the courtyard with a video camera. And this is a picture of the three of us here, so you know who to look for. Um, and really, uh, you know, we're happy to talk to anyone who wants to come and share their story. And we will also just go around and ask, you know, if, we're, if we're not getting a lot of volunteers, we're not afraid to uh, try to recruit volunteers. So hopefully some people will be excited to talk to us. Uh, and actually one other comment, if you have a longer story you wanna tell us, we're also interested in doing more in-depth interviews about implementations. So if you've been working with DHS2 and you think your project is really exciting or interesting or might be useful for the community to know about, uh, you can send me an email. My email is max at dhs2.org and uh, we can find a time over the next few days and I'll sit down with you and either record it or just uh, take notes. But that would be really great to hear more about what you're doing. So the next event uh, after the conference sessions themselves is tomorrow afternoon, and that's a uh, experts lounge. This happens on Tuesday and Wednesday. And this is an opportunity for you to sit down one-on-one -on -one and ask technical questions or raise issues uh, with people who work on specific areas of the DHS2 project. So a few examples here, for example, Android or Tracker or integration. There's a list of people who volunteered to do these expert languages that's on the conference website. So you can kind of know in advance who there is to talk to. And when you get there, there's just be seated, sitting at different desks around the same area where we're having the use case bazaar today. So we really encourage you to take advantage of that. This is a good opportunity for you to talk to people one on one and the core DHS2 team about how you're using the software or any issues or questions you might have come up with. Uh, this is a slide, for, especially for the people who are joining us remotely or anyone here who happens to want to tune into a presentation on Zoom. Um, you can find Zoom links to all sessions on the agenda on the website. And we will be live streaming all of these plenary sessions also on our YouTube channel and on the community practice uh, so people can ask questions there. Um, we're going to be using the same links for each of these tracks. We have basically four parallel session rooms, which equates to four digital tracks. And so each of those will have the same link every day. So just to make it easier for people to come back in or switch between them, you only really have to have uh, four links that you are keeping track of. Um, again, like I said, you can join from Oslo online if you'd like to, if you either can't find a space in the room or if you want to use the French interpretation services. Um, and as you saw this morning, we will occasionally have technical issues with that. Uh, just, you know, be patient. We're... Uh, always have a, some exciting bugs or equipment issues that happen every year. And that's just part of running a hybrid event. So I hope we have patience with us. All right, as I mentioned, the DHS2 Community in Practice is our, our community website. Hopefully you've all seen this before and used it. Uh, we really encourage everyone who's active in the DHS2 community to sign up because this is where we share a lot of news. This is where countries share a lot of innovations. This is where we announce our software releases. So it's really beneficial to be part of it. And we also use it during the conference to keep a record of what people share, to facilitate discussions during the conference and after the conference. And you can find all the posts that are related to the annual conference by using the tag DAC2023. Uh, so there is a, is a link to that in the banner on the homepage of the community practice. So it's easy to find that. You just click on that button and it'll automatically display a list of all the conference related topics. But you can also just search for that if you want to, to find them. And all the live streams for plenaries will be there. Um, and we are encouraging people who aren't here in person who want to ask questions or give comments to share them there in the COP. So you're also welcome to do that here if you like. If you think of something after a plenary is over, you can just go there and add a comment and the people responsible can go and answer it or share information on that platform. And now my colleague Alice will join us and talk about French interpretation. Yep. Um, yeah, it's good. Thank you. So um, as Max mentioned, all the sessions will be available on Zoom. And we will also provide for the French interpretation, live interpretation of the sessions. It's very easy to identify the sessions which are interpreted on the agenda because you can see the mention in English to, English to French. 
So, um, so yes, yeah, so you just need to click on the icon. You, sorry, you join Zoom, you click on the icon and you select French, and then you will access the French interpretation room where you'll be able to hear the, um, the speaker speaking in French. Donc, je recommence en français cette fois-ci. Um, comme pour les années précédentes, les, uh, nous fournissons l'interprétation en live des sessions, de toutes les sessions plénières, ainsi que de certaines sessions parallèles. Donc, euh, pour si vous souhaitez, si vous êtes francophone et que vous souhaitez écouter ces sessions en français, c'est très simple. Donc, d'abord, vous pouvez les identifier sur l'agenda. Elles auront la mention anglais-français. Ensuite, vous, euh, vous, lorsque vous rejoignez la session sur Zoom, vous verrez l'icône euh, interprétation. Vous cliquez sur l'icône, vous allez dans l'espace français et là, vous entendrez les interprètes euh, donc, bah, traduire du coup la, la, les sessions en français. Voilà. Et bien sûr, évidemment, euh, pour ceux qui sont sur place, n'hésitez pas à vous munir d'écouteurs de, de, si vous souhaitez, si vous êtes là, ici à Oslo, mais que vous souhaitez quand même euh, entendre les sessions en français. C'est très important. Voilà. Yes. So now here, you have a plan of the different uh, buildings that we're going to use for, for the annual conference. You can see that the plenary sessions will be hosted in Sophuslias Auditorium, which is where we are, while we will have the parallel sessions hosted in Wilhelm Birkness Hus. So it's, uh, it's literally like in, right in front of Sophuslias. So it's a couple of meters, not far at all. You will see also on the map where we'll be having the lunch, uh, which is the Frederic building. So it will be quite easy to find. It's also really uh, very close and you will have some signs to, to show you which direction to go to the lunch uh, building. Um, the coffee breaks will be in the morning here in Sophus Lies, as we will have the plenaries here, while the, the coffee breaks in the, in the afternoon will be hosted in William Birkness um, building. So do not hesitate to check really the agenda that you have on dac2023.dhs2.org to find out the venue for your session. And on top of that also, you will have the list of the sessions for each venue in front of the conference room on the door. So it's really easy if you want to double check in each room what sessions will be uh, are hosted every day. So now here you have, I guess you already had it, but if it's not the case, these are the uh, the um, the the Wi-Fi sorry the Wi-Fi network as well as the password. Um, and then the yeah, so we have also if you want to go to the toilets. Uh, unfortunately for ladies, the one in this building do not work, so it means that you will have to go to William Birkness. Uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it wasn't planned, but yeah. So it means that you have to go to the other building, the building that is used for the parallel sessions to go to the bathroom, but it's not far once again. And then for the men, it will be on the ground floor. Uh, you, can have, you will have the look at the signs which indicates what are, where are the toilets. So it's just um, downstairs. Water, yeah, clean and fresh. So don't hesitate to drink tap water and nice also. You have your DHS2 cups. I hope each of you have some. If not, we have bags available in the lobby so you can grab your bag and your cups. So today in this evening, right after the use case bazaar, we will have our pizza and drinks uh, party in William Birkness starting from seven, between 6.30 and seven actually, yeah. Uh, to 9 p.m. So it will be in the lobby of William Birkness. So the same building that we use for the parallel sessions. So, and also, um, if you want to tell us a little bit about your story with DHIS2, uh, what DHIS2 mean to, mean to you, don't hesitate to, uh, you will see that, uh, that Max, Grant and Chiquado, our colleagues from the communication team will be around with the camera ready to, to capture your, your testimony about what is DHIS2 and what it has meant to you. And then finally, the last day of the conference on Thursday afternoon, we will have our traditional uh, social events uh, with outdoor excursion, excursion food, uh, drinks. It will probably be in Songsvan, 
which is a very nice area. So uh, don't hesitate to bring your swimsuit as well, because I think it's going to be very warm around 28, I guess I see, I saw, yeah. So yeah, um, we'll have a lot of games, fun games, barbecue, yeah, traditional um, Norwegian party, if I can say. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, finally, as usual, um, we will have our, will be like in very interesting uh, sessions, but really we will need to make sure that we take our group picture. Uh, so it would be great if all of you could start uh, heading outside. It will be on Frederike Plassen, which is like the square right in the middle of the buildings. You can't miss it. Uh, it would be great if you could be there on time because we are such a large crowd. So I'm sure we'll need to make sure that everybody appears like everybody is nice and beautiful and smiling for the picture and it will to fall outside. Uh, yeah. And then also another tradition of ours, don't hesitate to take like pictures during the annual conference to share them with us. Uh, on social media, Facebook, Twitter, you just need to use the hashtag DAC2023 and we will select the best pictures and we'll show them on the last day of the conference. So yeah, be creative. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I was focused. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you have any questions, any issue you have the team here uh, the staff members who are ready to uh, to help you you can identify them because we have a blue tag like this with the black lanyard and well and some have some blue cask uh, hats baseball hats yeah <laughs> so uh, if you have any questions or issues yeah you can just uh, ask one of us or send us an email on Oslo 2023 at dhs2.org or obviously ask me as well <laughs> let's see so thank you everyone. We wish you a very nice and fruitful week in Oslo. And just a reminder that the plenaries will start every day at 8.30. And uh, as we were saying for the parallel sessions, please make sure you identify the correct venue for your session. Thank, thank you, The only thing I wanted to remind her was actually the thing there. It's only today that the plenary started at nine. So every other day, it will every each day it will be 8:30. So please be here on time because we have many, many things we want to showcase you guys. And I know it's very difficult to get people from the coffee and inside here. But I think there is a room for coffee now, isn't it? Yeah, we weren't sure how much, you know, for how long Kristin will talk in the mornings. So we didn't put a coffee break at them in the agenda. I'm joking, but uh, there is a there is a bonus coffee break now, and we can use it as a little bit of an exercise to see how quickly we can empty this room and fill it up again. Because. Uh, the just tune out to meet new friends and old friends. Thank you. Can we get an announcement for people that are in the room that aren't staff members to switch to using the next that they're using the conference Wi Fi instead of editing? Nobody who's not a UAO has access to the editing room. No, unless they're like from another university or anything like that. Okay, so we've just, we just had them started getting a little bit of an interest.
Ja. Vi ska se hur han i helvete här får den här då. Ja, det, nummer, det står markerat nummer 5 på den i hvert fall. Ja. Nei, for det er, det er bare den av den som har markert nummer 6 her. Som, det er en annen som ser ut som det skal være en til, men... Um, Jeg ser ikke helt hvor jeg kan... Du sier det er bare skrupen. Ja, nei, det, det er trådløs. Ja. Og ja, nei, men det er jo for kort. Nei, det er, det er trådløs SL Mik 5. Hva sa du nå? Om det er den som... Ja. Ja, for den skulle, den skulle vært fjernet. Ja. 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 Fordi... Um, ja, jeg er ikke sånn som mottakerne. Nei, det er, det er fortsatt i oppstartsfasen. Uh, jeg vet ikke sånn helt nøyaktig, men jeg tror det er ganske snart. Hva sånn da? Det er sånn, ja. Nei, for det er en normal debugging funktake. Eh, men de har i hvert fall nummer 6, og så har de eh, fire mygger og den eh, mix 7.
Hi, can you hear me? Hi, I'm on. Hello, is it on? Do I need to speak up? Do I need to speak up?
Don't be shy, come, come. Great start. Well done. We need to hold, yeah. hold that door a bit. Can you please, guys, come in? Otherwise, we cannot start without you. Come, come, see how fast you can move. We can, can start without you, but we don't want to. Come inside. Yeah, I'm just starting. Don't be shy. Come in front. There is still room in front. You can move around. You will not be stuck here for a week. Only until lunch, isn't it? Until lunch. Huh? So people come in, there is just a one announcement I forgot to tell. An announcement. Woohoo. Every minute you're late is a minute less of lunch. Come on, come, guys, come, let's come, go. Come, 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 come. Um, so, people, we are starting now. So, all the chit chat and chatting is over. Coffee break is over. I will give an announcement. It has actually been remember when we had the, um, the calling out for countries, ministries to raise. Sorry. Sorry, it has started. Hello. It's an important announcement because what we were not aware, we were aware, but we forgot. It's a big fire in, uh, in the city. Uh, not dangerous. It's only a warehouse, but they have been fighting with the fire since yesterday. And that's the reason why many of us, of you guys, were not here in the morning because they were stuck in the tram. So don't take the tram. It will have maybe be a couple of days without a tram, but the Tebana, the tube, the metro will work fine. So it's not a problem. I just wanted to, um, to say that, uh, remember we were asking for Ghana Health Service and Ministry of Health in Ghana, and they were not here. They were stuck in the tram. So please Ghana Health Service race. Woo! Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. So now we all know that we are not uh, uh, going to the tram, only the, the metro. So over to Austin. Thank you, Kristen. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I think Ulo wanted me to mention that if you can move a little bit in so that people that are coming in late don't have to climb over the top of you to get into their seats, that would be, that would be helpful. So move a little bit away from the, the inside edge, at least. Um, that would be great. All right. So who wants to talk about DHS2? Anybody interested? Woo, nice. I like the enthusiasm. We're going to talk about the latest features and releases in DHS2 versions 39 and 40. Those came out in November and May, respectively. Uh, and there's a lot that we're going to have to go over. So we're going to have to move pretty quickly. We're also going to try something a little bit different this time with some role play and, and theater. So um, if, we met, if, we, if we mess that up, please uh, apologize. I apologize in advance. 
So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Austin McGee. I'm the technical lead for DHS2, relatively new position for me, but excited to be here and share with you a bit about what we've been working on this past year. I'm not going to talk that much because I'm going to turn it over to uh, many of my colleagues who are going to dive into the details and, and share more about uh, what's, what's new in DHS2 in the last year. Okay, so first off, what have, what have we done? Uh, what has happened since the annual conference in 2022? We've had two major releases, as I mentioned, version 39 and 40. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's the kind of enthusiasm I like, thank you. <laughs> um, we, along with that, we also had two releases of the Android capture application. So that was version 2.7 and 2.8. And in addition to that, we, we kind of highlight the new features that come out with the major releases of DHS2. But we've also been doing a lot of other work behind the scenes. So probably many of you have seen uh, the patch releases that are to all the supported versions of DHS2 to add a few minor features and mostly fix bugs and issues uh, and make sure that it's as stable and as, as reliable as possible. We've also had a number of hot fixes to address critical issues in a very timely manner. So we have hot fixes for supported releases about every two months. But if there's something that needs to come out quicker than that or needs to come out across all the versions at the same time, we release a hot fix. So that might be a security issue. It might be a critical performance issue, something like that. So this is again, trying to address and get out there as quickly as possible, the most stable, reliable version of DHS2 that we can. I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things we've been doing behind the scenes. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, or a lot about the different features that are in DHS2, but there's a lot that's going on uh, to, to make that happen and to make DHS2 better in, in more subtle ways. So this is uh, an effort that we have ongoing for uh, improving the design and usability of DHS2. So we have a new team that joined us um, at the beginning of last year in 2022, uh, doing functional analysis and functional design. And we're expanding the design team as well and working with some partners to, to really improve the usability of DHS2 as a product, which in the end leads to better data and better use of data in pro programs that actually matter. So there's a lot of steps that go into design, right? So. We've got talking to users, we've got exploring how they actually interact with DHIS2, um, testing how they, uh, how they use the software and how they understand it from a, a training perspective as well. And then using that to inform how we build DHIS2 software. We've started, as, I saw, as you saw previously, uh, focused primarily on the Android capture application, which is typically the, the um, last mile user of DHIS2, but this is going to, to spill over into all areas of the product. So that includes the data entry on the web, it includes the uh, way you manage and configure DHIS2, as well as how you analyze data. Another important important thing that's going on kind of behind the scenes uh, in the last year is the move to continuous release. And this is something that's been ongoing for a little while, but what it means is that the core releases, so those two major releases we came out with in the last year, are just a, a, a small piece of the puzzle because those are now decoupled from each of the applications that we have. This means that every application in DHIS2 can be independently released by the core, core team at UIO also can be uh, custom applications built by anyone in the community that can be deployed through the App Hub. And we can release those independently and also support multiple versions of DHIS2 core with a version of well, that uh, no, application. So this avoids the risk uh, of uh, needing to upgrade your entire server just to address a small issue or a, a small improvement to the user interface, because you can update an application independently and very quickly roll that back without a lot of risk. It allows us to release features and bugs, uh, bug fixes more quickly. So we don't need to wait until the next major release to do some of those uh, improvements and get those into the wild. And it allows for us to have also shorter interaction, uh, sort of iterations, apologies, uh, and user feedback, which feeds into that design process to better improve the software overall. So you can already find a lot of these applications that the team at UIO develops, um, as well as those that are built by the community, 
on the App Hub and in the App Management app on DHIS2. And many of the features that we are going to talk about here today that are in 39 or 40 are also available for 38, or if they were introduced in 40, are already available in version 39 because they're just updates to the application and that application happens to support 38, 39, and 40, for example. Some things because they have requirement but for any feature that doesn't have that requirement, we're able to quickly introduce that uh, way that works across different supported to. This is a very exciting uh, step change, and it's been a long time coming, but we're getting to the point where the majority of our applications are actually on this new uh, mechanism for delivery. End users. Thank you. I, I uh, I'll buy you lunch later. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did mention also that that is available for not only the applications that are released by the UIO team, but also for applications that are released from the community. So we've had the ability to install and extend DHS2 with web applications for quite some time. Um, and all of the, basically we're eating our own dog food, as they say, which means that we are using the tools that we build for the community for our own releases. I also wanted to highlight one last thing about the version 40 release, and this is our beta testing program. So this is something that uh, was introduced in 39, I believe, um, but it really took off in the 40 release cycle. We worked with seven, I think it was more than seven in the end, with different organizations to do extensive testing of version 40 before it was even released. So more than 11,000 tests were performed by these organizations on realistic databases that they're actually using in production. So they were upgrading to version 40 and testing all of the functionality one at a time. We had a pretty impressive uh, pass rate and 96% is not 100%, but that means that the other issues, so all that 4% of issues that might've had something that wasn't exactly as it uh, um, was expected to be, uh, were followed up and the critical issues were fixed and those that were, weren't as critical are fixed in the future uh, patch releases of those that version 40. So really excited to see this uh, take off in version 40 and hopefully it will uh, manifest in a very stable and um, uh, smooth upgrade process for everyone once you upgrade to version 40. And we're hoping to continue and expand this in the future as well. So I wanted to, to thank a few people who were involved with this. There were quite a, quite a number of people. Um, first of all, the, the QA team at UIO, so the, the DHS2 QA team, and Phil in particular um, has really been the champion of this. So huge thank you to Phil for putting this all together and the rest of the team as well for, for really making that, um, making that possible. Phil's right there so everybody can, can, can look at him. <laughs> uh, and then we also, of, of course, I want to thank our beta testing partners who were involved in this and um, spent, spent their time to make sure that we're testing each of the features and functionalities within DHIS2 very rigorously with production databases and, and real use cases. Um, and a special thanks to a couple contributors from HISP uh, Sri Lanka who, in addition to doing tests and, and being part of the beta testing process, helped us to improve it and really had some good, uh, good feedback and input on how we can improve that process and make sure that it's, it's, it's fully covering all of the functionality in DHIS2. So with that, that's all, that's all the behind the scenes stuff. Now we get to the pretty pictures. Um, we're gonna go through the different product streams within DHIS2 one at a time. Uh, and we're gonna introduce, uh, the product managers are each going to introduce the features that are in version 39 and version 40. We're not necessarily gonna split them out and say this is in 39 and this is in 40. You can go to the release notes to figure that out, but you'll see what's new in the last year of DHIS2 development. And I hope that you enjoy what you see. Uh, we'll finish with, uh, as I said, a little bit of that theater um, to, to show how these features kind of work together in a, in a 
pseudo realistic situation um, to make a DHS2 system serve the, the needs of a, a real um, implementation or real, real use case. So with that, I'll turn it over to Marta Vila, uh, my colleague from the Android team to talk about the functionality that's in the Android capture app, versions 2.7 and 2.8. Hello? Yes. Salut, this one here, if you prefer. Thank you, Austin. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Marta Vila, the Android or mobile product manager. I'm pleased and honored to present one year more the work that the Android team has been doing. So this, um, the difference with the demo means that we are going to go through our features without demo now. So we hope it's not very heavy. Um, we have kept it light. And, but if there are doubts or things that are not clear, please join us in the, um, in the what's the name? Expert launches that we have tomorrow and uh, Wednesday at 5 p.m. If you have questions about this, it's not only for doubts or anything. It's just to discuss the products. So let's start with Android. Um, in these last two versions, we have mainly focused in user experience and implementation support, but we have also done some functional parity. We have new Android web apps, and we have an exciting use case data flow that I will explain later. And the first one is the real-time stock management module, which is for LMIS. So for user experience, uh, the data sets in the last two versions have had a real big change. So what the, I mean, the layout seems different, but the main functionalities that we have been requested for so long is to resize the columns. So you can do that now easily by, with a drag and drop. The tables also render the color that you select when you configure the data set. You can use legends and the scrolling when the table is big up and down and sideways, it has been improved as well. And the data entry, do I have a mouse? Yes. So the data entry form keeps the context uh, for the user. This little field is new from 2.7. So moving on to the sync process was also one of the, the processes or parts of the app that we got uh, more requests. So we have improved the sync process, mainly the first one. Most of you using the app know that the first sync, closer. Okay. Uh, so most of you that have used the app know that the first thing is the one when we download all the metadata and all the data. So it's a bit slow sometimes. The time that it uses now is the same, but we have tried to make it more dynamic by opening the home screen right after the app knows the metadata. And then when the, the data is loading, we are informing the user what's, what's happening, which, which program is actually being uh, download it's downloading the data. And the full thing will happen only the first time. So not every time you open the app. That's a big improvement for, for Brian as a community health worker. <laughs> uh, the other thing that we have improved here and we, are, we hope it really helps, this is very new, is the contextual sync error feedback, which is this little uh, dialogue here. So now we had already messages for it errors that were adapted to the context, but what is new now is that the user can navigate from whenever, whatever screen in the app it is to the actual error in the form to fix it by only tapping on top of the, of the error when it's on the screen. So you can go from the home screen or the program screen down to the form and you have the field highlighted, like this is the field that is wrong. So we really hope this helps navigating the, the sync errors. So moving on. Uh, we have new renderings for tracker and data entry. First one, uh, the digital signature. You can now collect a signature for consent or however your configuration needs it using the, the mobile phone. This is stored as an image. So it's the value type image and it has a specific rendering type. And then we have added a few actionable buttons for three uh, value types. So the email, the phone number, and the URL value types will, not, will now be actionable. So if the user taps in the phone, for example, it will go to the phone app in the device and, and let you call that patient, for example. Same for the email and same for the, if you have URLs. Thank you. 
Uh, another rendering improvements is that we have extended the rendering types for the option sets. The option sets, I don't know if this is widely used, but you can decide the rendering of your option sets. It can be a radio button, it can be a checkbox in horizontal or in vertical. And if you assign icons to your options, it can also be visual data entry and your icons will be rendered there. So this worked only for text before option sets with value type text. You can use them now for any value type that you are using on your option set. So we hope this helps making data entry a bit more intuitive for the users. There are many other fixes that we have been doing. We have increased the tappable areas in the icons and in buttons. We have added loading banners in the process that were reported that were taking some time so that the user doesn't feel that the app is frozen. We have improved the offline user experience by either removing the options or informing the user that this option doesn't work because you don't have internet. We have improved the display of long text in some places of the app. And then the navigation of the sections that now have this next button here because the accordion was not uh, really intuitive. We are looking at this uh, as part of the design project. So hopefully we'll improve it even more, but for now we hope this next button helps uh, the user know what to do when they reach the last data element. So that's all about user experience. Moving, on about, moving now on about functional parity, mainly with tracker. We have two main aspects that were, we were a bit behind. Well, one that we were behind, which is the file value type. The file value type was not supported in the app. It is supported now in the app uh, for tracker and for data sets. Um, yeah, there is a maximum that you can configure for download. So we will make sure we don't download very heavy files from the server when you sync. You can set that up in the Android settings web app. And then the working list with data elements, this were not, we were not uh, behind. It's been released together in Android and, and Tracker. So Mike will present this later. But just to say it will go together where the working list already were. And the Android user, the community health worker, last mile user is not supposed to create the working list for now. They will be configured on the server and then the app will download them and offer them as a filter. So now about the web apps there are two new web apps and one of them is APK distribution. I'm gonna explain you this one right away. The other one is use case configuration. I will explain that one at the end of the, the presentation. And this is part of uh, was, what Austin was presenting. You just have to go to the app, to the app hub and app, manage, app management app and then app hub and find them and install them on your server. So the app APK distribution web app we are very excited to see how this is adopted because this has been highly requested. We are trying to offer functionalities that normally will be provided by an MDM uh, software, but we know that most or some implement, most implementations don't have it. So what we are trying to do with this is, uh, is obviously part of the effort for supporting implementation from an admin perspective. So what the APK, so what this app uh, is doing is to let the admin control the app, uh, the update of versions of the apps in their own instance. So you choose which version you want uh, your users to have, and they will have auto update, but from the version that you say here, you decide when to update an app, an, a version here and not Google Play. So if you, yay. And uh, and uh, thank you. That was really <laughs> spontaneous. Um, so yeah, we we are very excited to see how this takes um, into the field and and how can we expand this MDM-ish uh, functionalities. More on implementation support. We have removed the limit of offline accounts. Uh, we had a limit of three before. There is no limit now. We are worried about memories in the devices, but that's on you now. Uh, <laughs> so we hope that helps. It was it was really requested from the community. And then it, there was another request that is not fancy, but uh, but it was apparently a bit painful, which is that the, the Android settings web app required an all authority. So that is not the case anymore. It has its own authority now. So those of you that requested it, I hope you are happy. 
we think this is going to make a difference as well. And then moving on, uh, because I'm taking a bit long, this is the second web app, is the use case configuration web app. We are also very excited about this one. Let's see if I manage to explain it properly. What this web app is letting you have a specific app module for your use case. A module is something that lets you configure your program and parameters to have a different data entry flow and user experience. So, for example, if you have configured uh, your program, let's say, uh, this is not a real example, but if you have configured your logistics program to use the specific UI developed for it, and I will show you a real example right now, when the user, it's, it's totally integrated in the app, but when the user opens that program that you have set in the server, this uses the this specific data entry flow and user experience, it will open a different screen like this one here, this is real, but you don't lose the rest of the functionality of the app for the other uh, programs. So if you have data sets, if you have programs that use the regular user interface that we all know, they are all here. It's integrated as well as the analytics. So we think this is contributing to the functional extensibility. Right now it's really tied into the application, but we hope in next versions, this can be more dynamic and more open to uh, external use cases that are developed in the community. So this is the real example. Is the real time stock management module developed um, together with the LMIS team and his South Digitus. And what it does is that it allows for real time stock management of health products at facility level. It has, yes. There's a lot of work in this module, I have to say. So, so it, it uh, has the barcode scanner up there. So the functionalities that it uses from the HIS2 are the same, but the way the data entry flow works and the and the this and the UI is designed is totally different for the use case of stock control. So it allows for barcode scanner. The actions are distribution, discard, and correction of workflow. It has the offline uh, capability because it's on top of the app. So it uses the SDK and everything that was built in. And it allows for possible real-time integration with, uh, with ELMIS. So this is not going to be demo today. So I really invite you to join the LMIS session later today at 1 p.m. in Auditorium 4. Is it correct? I hope. Yes. If not, check uh, the app. There will be also a stand in the bazaar later. I'm sure if you visit them for that, you will get very good cookies, George. <laughs> they're delicious and then there, there will be also in the expert launch uh, both the days so please if you are thinking or in, of interested in, in logistics at the facility level join join those sessions for a proper demo and a proper explanation of the use case and this is my last my last slide mike over to you to present tracker I think I'll try out this microphone. Is this one okay? Yeah. And based on all the chatter, it sounded to me like uh, Breno and George, you'll see a lot of participation from the logistics side. So yeah, nice. So I'm Mike Frost, the product manager for, we always say tracker, but actually it's all the individual level data that this team works on, whether it's the events or longitudinal data and tracker. And, and actually where most of this is uh, functionality is now is within the Capture app. And so I'll, I'll talk to you a bit about that. Just to say that during this time period, 39 and 40, we've had dramatically increased scale for the, the implementations for individual data. Um, this is showing a, a slide I think that we've shared before, but this has become more and more the norm in, in a lot of countries. So not only are there 75 plus uh, government owned systems, but they are hitting this very large national scale with millions and millions of people being registered, uh, 40, 50,000 users. And what we've had to focus on a lot is making sure that the, the database can handle it and that the performance is something that will encourage use and would not lead to uh, all of the, the kind of offline or ad hoc data collection. So just, uh, I, I know there's always more to go, but we have been doing a lot to try to get the system to be able to handle this kind of load. There's been huge improvements to program indicators, for example, in terms of performance, particularly in 240. You'll continue to see 
see more and more of uh, these kind of performance improvements, uh, which we hope is a good motivation for upgrading and for moving on to the more recent versions of the, the Capture app uh, and, and of DHS2. So talking a little bit about this, those of you that have been around for a while know that the Tracker Capture app is quite old and uh, has been something that's with us in our hearts for a long time. But we, we have rebuilt it uh, entirely in the, the Capture app. We have almost full parity between the two at this point. And this will be the, the first time that I'm really urging you to move on. Let, let it go. Let it go. So just to give you one sense of a reason why the, we've been able to, to redesign the Capture app from the ground up, meaning that we got to have a lot of time focusing on usability, the way that we've been talking about before. I'm not going to go into every detail of that, but I wanted to show you just from the, the very simple uh, enrollment screen here, there's it on first glance, they look similar, but there's actually so many changes in this to improve for the user who is doesn't have to be a DHS2 expert. They're probably somebody very busy. We know that they're entering a lot of data, trying to make it as easy as possible. So adding in little tool tips that tell them the context of what they're doing. They're saving a person in a child program in Ngelehun or putting a, a loading uh, button to show that the system actually is doing something when they hit save person. We're adding, uh, removing all of that context on the left and being able to put the full trail up on the top, adding more contextual information that gets pulled from your labels, your configuration that would tell them it's a person, it's a new person in program child, pulling from your track entity type. So there's really quite a lot of effort that's going into usability, trying to make it uh, a much more intuitive product. Actually, many of you in this room contribute to that. We have weekly meetings where we go through use cases. We talk through user scenarios. We present back designs. These designs are being taken to the countries where we work often and being tested out. So a lot more effort going into this. And we hope that that means that it will end up being something that you're really happy to switch to from the Tracker Capture app. Uh, giving you a sense of some of the things that are in there that aren't just feature parity, but actually completely new. Having something like an enrollment dashboard where you could see the different uh, stages all at a glance, the previous events, be able to interact with them individually, but maintaining context over on the side that would give information about this person or this tract entity with the appropriate indicators, their profile. So a, a lot, a kind of a landing page that gives a lot more of the context and overview. Um, improving the enrollment uh, widget, giving the information not only of where they were enrolled, but where the they started this program, who currently owns the program, when it was last updated. So a lot of information that can be contextually very useful, improvements in scheduling and how that works. We've had for quite some time requests to, to make it, again, much more of a dedicated service to be able to go and to schedule uh, an event and not bury that in, in some kind of menu. So we've pulled that out. It has its own specific landing page. So I'll, I'll leave aside the usability stuff just to say we also invite you to continue to participate with us on usability. There's many times that we'll ask uh, if we can bring and test out new functionality with you, with your users. If that's something that's of interest to, to your programs, let us know because we're always looking for new scenarios. So then moving on to talk a little bit about working lists. Um, the first thing I want to do is, is back up a little bit about what the working list is. This is meant not as analytics. This is a tool for the person using uh, Capture to have a list of what, what things they want. What, how do they need to group these things based on what scenarios that matches their work processes? So this is a, it's a, a commonly used term in, in, in various clinical management systems. They want to find the specific people or the specific items they need to follow up with. And being able to give them these kinds of tools is going to really improve their experience for the data capture, data use. So just to show you some of the examples of these features, you can, for example, make a specific list and assign tasks. They can be assigned uh, to yourself as a user, perhaps you're a manager and you wanna see which tasks are assigned to which user. So being able to allow the, the assignation of these tasks. Um, of course, it's flexible in terms of what you decide to include in the list, picking from the, the various columns, which ones you actually want to show, what information to provide. 
And then crucially in the latest release, being able to add in data. So having not just the attributes and, and that contextual information, but actually data from specific program stages. And so you can see, for example, a working list here where the, the clinical user wanted to see all of the, the children of low birth weight because they're, they have a specific action that they're trying to follow up with these groups. You can pull up the data element for low birth weight, put in the range that is accepted for that and have generated from your data, the list of infants to be able to follow up with. These of course can be saved as a specific view and that's what we are encouraging uh, you as the program owner or configurer to do, set up some specific working lists for the tasks that that user is going to have saving it so that it's then available for them to easily click a button and get the, the specific list of, of tracked entities or people that they need. So I'll move on from working with this. Ownership analytics uh, is something that has been troubling us, I think, for a long time, especially those of us uh, working on the HIV side of things. Very challenging. I know there's a lot going on here. Don't worry too much. This is really just to show you a single person, of course, can be enrolled at one clinic and receive services elsewhere. And that can happen as just a referral where kind of the ownership of that person remains at the original org unit. But it can also be a transfer. And it can be that from then on, they start to receive services at a new site, a new clinic that's opened or that they've moved, et cetera. And so what we've worked with is to be able to, to include uh, the ability in program indicators to capture this kind of dynamic change, right? So you make the choices based on the indicators you're trying to calculate, what level of context you needed. Did you need to know where they were enrolled, where they were registered, what currently is the owning org unit, or what was the owning org unit back in the past in the time period that you are doing the analytics? So this is a big step forward for us. We hope actually to do even a bit more with this when it comes to the analytics apps. But as of now, you can be doing this in your program indicators directly, and you'll have a very easy just drop down menu showing you how to, to choose the analytics context that you want. Um, one more word about continuously released. I put this up here so that you could get a glance at what we mean when we say continuous release. This is uh, the versions that have come out since June 1st of the Capture app, meaning that we in the app are able to constantly be adding in required features, uh, required changes, updates, fix and in the app hub, it would tell you, for example, update to latest version, and it will tell you which version that is. It has very easily that you can uninstall the version that you have. And again, crucially for us, we know upgrade processes are very challenging. They can be technically very difficult, politically very difficult, and you don't need to update the back end uh, to, in order to upgrade this app. And in fact, we've done everything we can to make the newest features compatible backwards to 238, which is when the Capture app was, was really coming out. Meaning that right now, if you're, you're not able to get up to 240 in order to take advantage of it, most of the new features you can get through the Capture app through an update. Pressing that button is kind of instantaneous. It's a very quick and easy, painless process. That doesn't mean you don't ever upgrade again. In fact, there are a number of things that won't be able to work uh, if you're installing and hoping to get, for example, uh, the, the program indicator changes for ownership analytics. You would need to upgrade the whole thing. But, but a lot of the kind of user experience, usability features, things that can change the look and feel of the app, those are available backwards compatible. So you can have the latest version of Capture even if you're on several versions back in, in terms of the, the back end. The last thing I want to throw up here was a, a big thanks to our implementation team that's been working on the design guide for the, the individual data for Tracker. This is something we haven't had uh, for years and years. You've all been just uh, making your own approaches to this, which is great. But we finally have some very detailed information uh, about uh, what considerations there are when you're setting up your program and giving you recommendations about the best way to structure them. So with that, I will finish up. Good morning, everyone. I'll try to use this mic. Uh, my name is David Kennedy. I've just come on board as the new platform product manager. Um, I'd like to introduce all of the features that have come onto platform for last year. 
I haven't been here for the whole year. So if we go into a little bit more detail, so if you want a little bit more detail, please come and find me and I'll point you to someone that, that can explain it a bit better. We're diving into a big one here. We have a brand new data entry app for aggregate data. Um, this has been released now on a brand new technology stack. The old app was about 10 years old, so it was time for an upgrade. Um, we're currently running both the existing old data entry app and the new one um, at the moment. And what we'll do is we'll be adding more and more features to the new app, and then slowly, hopefully, people will move across before we can retire the old app. So don't panic. If you're very entrenched in, in the way that you're doing the aggregate data entry, the, new, uh, the old one will be around for a while. There's some great new features into the, the new version. As you can see, similar to the new capture app, the, the top bar has the full context, which will stay with you as you scroll down so that you can see which org unit, which um, period, which data set you're do doing. So you can you maintain the contact context. Um, this one's also been very well uh, received. We've got an org unit data filter. So if you're browsing the org units and the data set has not been assigned to that specific uh, org unit, it will show up with a little um, cross there. So you can't select an org unit that doesn't have the data set attached to it. Um, we've added some extra uh, details to, on the side. You can see the min and max limits, the history and the audit log without having to, to change or go into a different screen. So you can scroll through and see that extra information as you, as you go. And you can also see the validation also on the sidebar there without having to switch context. All right. There's also a lot of improvements to the offline data sync. This was something that we had a lot of requests for. Um, there's a lot behind the scenes here that I will not try to explain how it works. If you do want a more, ex more detailed explanation, um, I'll find someone that can explain it better. All right, a little bit of a shift. We've got now um, multiple org unit geometries. What this means is that for each org unit, you can have not just the point location for the, say where that facility is, but also the capture area. So you can have a, uh, an area and a point location or multiple capture areas for different, different uses um, to be displayed in the maps. And then there's also a crosscut app, which will allow you to generate those capture areas. So if you don't have the uh, GeoJSON files, you can go and generate them with CrossCut and upload them to the, to the org unit. We also have a cool feature that is integrated with the Google Earth engine. Now this allows you to automatically load an org unit uh, geography to the Google Earth engine and bring in, bring in the population data. So if you don't have good population data already in the system, you can use this service to actually bring that in, use it as a denominator for indicators and analytics. <laughs> so here's a little screenshot of how that works. You can select the org units, link it up, and bring in that population data. And here's a preview. You can preview before you load it, so you can sense check, make sure it, it looks correct before loading it in. This is one that we expect to be quite popular. There's a new multi-select for the text box in the data entry. So, <laughs> yeah. so this is a very, very requested feature. We're happy to say that it's available now. One screenshot here, as you can see, rather than just one choice, you can have multiple colors, red, blue, green, just red, just blue. You can clear a filter. Um, there's lots and lots of ways that I'm sure that people will love to use this. Moving to a little bit more superficial, not so technical. New app icons. <laughs> everyone, yeah, everyone might be used to the old ones, but the new ones, there's there's uh, references to the old ones. You'll be able to see some familiarity, but now there's some consistency. It looks a bit easier. Hopefully, aid the navigation flicking through um, all of the different apps. The apps haven't changed, so if you upgrade and you see that the icons have changed, don't stress that all the apps have changed. We're just changing the icons at this point. Uh, here's another big one the aggregate data exchange service and app, we'll have a look at it. This is really, really powerful new feature. This allows you to either transfer um, aggregate data from one instance to another or within the same instance. So this allows you to take tracker data and put it into an aggregate um, form or actually upgrade, up, upload data to a different instance. So if you, for example, wanted to take 
uh, tracker data for uh, COVID uh, vaccinations delivered for a certain age group and put that into one um, aggregate value to upload to an HMIS, you can do that through this service. Um, the, it runs at the moment as a service and through the API. Uh, there is a web app that we are also will be in continuous improvement. So at the moment it's there, but we'll be adding a lot more features um, very soon. Here's a couple of screenshots of how that works in the web app. Um, and this will, the configuration will be improved uh, a lot over the next coming years. We also have improved data integrity checks, lots of these. Um, these are really powerful to help the data instance managers find out what the data quality issues might be within their instance. There's 25 at the moment. We are going to keep adding more and more. So this allows them to run really quick checks to see where there might be issues with the data and go and find them and fix them. Um, so you can see here the interface, lots of different uh, choices. And again, the more and more choices will come to help people clean up the data. Moving along to job sequencing. So this is again a bit more back end, um, but it will allow people to bunch jobs into either parallel or sequential um, sections so that you can run a whole series of jobs. If you need to run analytics before you do something else, you can now sequence it, set it all off and not have to run each job and wait for it to finish before starting the next one. The, this is a big, exciting one for a lot of people. The API for DHS2 has gotten very, very big, very, very extensive. Uh, and that means that it can be hard to find the right place in the API for, the, for what you're looking for. So now the open API three specifications are available, uh, which means that you can download the entire API and use a browser like Stoplight to go through and see what all the, um, the functions are, be able to navigate certain sections. So you, if you want to just look at one part of the API, not the whole thing, you can look at focusing on that one section. So hopefully this allows developers to um, browse the API faster, find out more information, make more ex extensible apps. Um, this is another one that's, that's quite technical, but will be very, very exciting for, for people that have been waiting for it. Um, this is event hooks, which means that you can set something up to listen for a change in the system without having to go back and check frequently whether that, that um, item has changed. At the moment, it's available for the metadata and schedule scheduler um, features, but this will be coming more and more. We'll be moving this to meta users and, and data itself. So this means you can set up an, an event hook to listen uh, for, for example, when the analytics is, has finished running and then have an activity either in the cons a console, webhook, uh, Artemis or Kafka. And there might be more targets coming soon as well. Um, so this is a preview in 40. So that means that it is fully featured, but only for a couple of uh, metadata elements and we'll be expanding that soon. This is another kind of more technical one that might be very exciting for people that have been waiting for it. This root API uh, means that you can now access external services that through the DHS2 server, where you store the credentials on the server and you don't have to have that external service exposed to the public internet anymore. So this allows you to be a little bit more secure, allows you to access more external services without worrying about um, exposing them to the internet and has a lot of uh, expandability options. So I think that's me done. I'd like to pass over to Scott. Okay, best for last. Um, I'm Scott, I'm the Analytics Product Manager. I'll also respond to Mike or, Aust or by Austin as well. Everybody gets us confused. David shaved his beard off, so I think that's probably clear who David is. Um, before I get into it, I just want to say that I am not going to talk about maps. And the reason I'm not talking about maps is because there is a mountain of new incredible functionality in the Maps app, and it deserves its own plenary session, which will be tomorrow morning. So tomorrow morning, we're going to do all maps, um, and, and you're going to be able to see a lot of the uh, incredible things that have come. But don't worry, we have lots of other fantastic analytics apps, and I'll go through those now. So just jumping straight into it, a very long requested functionality is now the ability to add custom calculations in the data visualizer application. So what does this mean? This means that you're a district health officer 
and your system admin never answers their emails or they don't listen to you and you need a new indicator, right? So instead of just doing it in Excel, now you can just make it, make it yourself in DHIS2. And you can actually see that once you make the new calculation, it's tied to the data dimension. So that means it shows up just like other indicators or data elements. It can be applied to any different chart type that you have in the data visualizer application. Um, and it will be saved to this particular um, chart. But even better, it actually can be saved and you can reuse it in other chart types. So a few uh, important things to remember here. It does not create a new indicator. So for all of you sys admins out there who are kind of like, oh crap, now they're gonna make a ton of new indicators. It doesn't make a new indicator. Don't worry, you still have control over that. But what it allows them to do is create what they, we call a calculation that is saved in DHIS2 and also able to be pulled in um, to other charts, other uh, analytics that are made in the data visualizer application. So you still have your you still have your key, your key population or key impact indicators, um, and those are run by sys admins. But you can, as a user now, make your own calculations that you can use in multiple charts, maps. Um, well, not maps, but multiple charts as well. Um, it can be applied to any chart type. So not just pivot tables, but bar, column, pie, whatever you want. And of course it will show up on your dashboard once you, once you put it in. Okay. I am very happy to announce that all of the analytics apps or well, nearly all of the analytics apps are on the app hub. So just as the others have mentioned, we'll be able to make continuous improvements and releases to these apps. So some bug fixes, some small new functionality. Of course, if there's something that requires a backend change, then we'll have to wait to the next release. But if it's a front end issue, we can hopefully continuously release that and make it available to you. We have also in the line listing app added legends. Um, so you're able to now apply a legend to your line list. So it looks something like this. And one fun fact about this ticket is, or this functionality is, this was actually the oldest ticket that, or oldest functionality request that we had still in DHIS2. It was made back in 2016 by Lars. Uh, if you're familiar with our ticketing system, it was DHIS-75. And for context, we are now at DHIS-15,000 something. So, so the moral of the story is don't give up. <laughs> we will. <laughs> don't be discouraged. Of course, of course, we had to build a whole new application to add this functionality to it, but we did eventually get there. So uh, keep hanging in. Okay, you're also able to add the scheduled date to the line list app. So what does this mean? This means that you can look at um, persons who were scheduled for appointments last week, but didn't show up. You can look at persons who are scheduled for appointments next week or next month, and you can show those in the line listing app. And I'm also very happy to announce that the line listing is available now on dashboards in version 38, 39, and 40. Pause for plot. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know a lot of folks were um, were getting a little impatient. I appreciate your patience, uh, and I'm happy to say that now you you can have all of your line lists on your dashboards. An additional functionality is the ability to add a legend and an icon to the single value chart types. So you can see an example here, um, and and you know. Just like all the other products, we're, going, we're constantly going through a process of improving the user experience, making the data come more alive, uh, make it more available, easy, more easily interpretable. And so we understand that adding these icons and then just changing the entire background color uh, hopefully makes it pretty obvious in terms of performance and exactly what the indicator is measuring. The icon, of course, is selected through the um, icon library in the maintenance app, configuring the data element or the indicator. We have to talk a little bit about performance. We are continuously making performance improvements and investigating performance issues. And I wanna sincerely thank all of those who come to us with performance issues. Although we are doing much more rigorous testing, you all are using DHIS2 in many different ways that we can never test for in different contexts, scenarios, scales, whatever. And, um, and there will be performance issues that you might run into that there's just no way for us to necessarily know about uh, giving our test environments or our testing team. 
Uh, and over the last year, you've been communicating these to us, at least quite a few of you have been, and we've been trying to make continuous improvements to the analytics performance. So I'm also happy to say that analytics queries are about 25 to 40% faster over 2.35, and we're able to now generate our uh, analytics tables about 40% faster. But continue to please communicate to us, and number one rule is don't suffer in silence. If you run into analytics problems, do reach out. And I think that is it from me. So now, Thank you, Scott. All right, now we get to do the, the fun part of the evening, uh, morning, whatever, wherever we are. <laughs> it all blends together these days, huh? Um, okay, so we've just heard a lot of very cool features. Can we have one more round of applause for all of everybody that went into, everything that went into making those? I think that was also record time for how quickly we got through all of those features that were released in the last year. I think we skipped quite a few as well. So definitely look at the release notes and, and the webinars, which go into a bit more detail about what, uh, what we have introduced in each of the releases. So this next uh, section is gonna be, gonna be a little bit interesting because we're actually going to have a little bit of role play. Um, we have a few, make sure I'm here. We have a few actors in this, this little uh, scenario for you. Um, Brian, uh, my colleague from the implementation support team at UIO is going to be playing an outreach nurse. Um, we have Vittoria, who's going to be playing a district health officer, and I will be the omniscient narrator slash DHS2 system administrator. <laughs> I will do my best to, uh, to stay in character, but I might, I might uh, contextualize things a little bit for you as well. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to just weave together a few of the features that you saw here in uh, introduced in DHS2 version 39 and version 40. And we're going to uh, show you how, how those work together in a pseudo realistic situation or scenario. So in order to do that, I got to switch the screen here. I believe I'm doing this correctly. Yes. It's a little bit blurry perhaps, but you should be able to see my screen here now. So as your uh, omniscient system administrator, I am going to uh, be doing a little bit of configuration to get us set up. I'm not actually gonna be configuring the system, but I'll do some, some apps to install some applications to get the latest versions of the software. Uh, and then we'll uh, go to our correspondent in the field, um, who is the, the outreach nurse, Brian, and that'll be in just a couple of minutes. But to start us off, I'm going to go ahead and install a couple of applications that have been uh, continuously released in DHIS2. So to do that, I'm gonna to go to the app management application. As we saw earlier, this is where you can see a lot of different um, apps and the new versions that are available. So as soon as they're published or released, it shows up on my screen. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, as soon as it, uh, as soon as a, a version of an application is released, it'll show up here in the app management application. You can update your applications independently. Uh, we'll get back to core apps here in a minute um, to do some updates there. But first, uh, I'm going to start with what Scott just introduced, which is this line listing application. So you'll see I actually already have this installed, but you can see uh, the list here, all of the versions that have been released of the line listing application. Uh, and you can go ahead and install it into your system to get that uh, functionality. And as, as Scott mentioned, this is available from 238, 239, and 240. Uh, so this same version of the application with all the latest features, maybe some that are turned on and off based on the version of the server you're talking to are available there. So I've already got, uh, installed this one. Uh, I would click a button here to, to do that. Uh, I'm actually gonna uh, demo that. So I just uninstalled it. Now you can see that I don't have a version installed here and I'm gonna click the install button to install the latest version. It takes just a couple seconds and there we go. We have the line listing application installed into our DHIS2 instance. There's one more application that I'd like to install here as well. Um, I actually already have this one installed as well, um, but you can see that this is the APK distribution application. So I'll do uh, that one in just a moment. Um, and the last thing is a very cool feature that Scott just uh, mentioned, which is putting line lists onto the dashboard app. 
in order to have this functionality, we need to have the latest version of the dashboard app. So here in the core apps section of the app management app, you can see the, the versions of or the, the applications that are built into DHIS2 that have updates available. So there's obviously a dashboard application already in this DHIS2 version 40 instance, but I can actually go here and we'll see that this one just was released on continuous release last week, June 6th. With, with this version. So this is after the 40.0.0 release, and there is a new version available that I can go ahead and install. So if I click install here, I'll get the latest version of the dashboard application, which allows me to include line listing application, line lists on my dashboard. And with that, I think we're all set up. I did wanna show here also quickly, uh, we're not gonna use this for the demo, but I could also uh, update the version of the Android capture application. So you'll see that I already have a version installed here in my system. Uh, that is version 100.32.8. Uh, the version numbers are, are continually increasing and each, each application has different version numbers. So usually you just wanna go to the latest one, but you can go ahead and install that latest one if you wanted to. You can keep it on a slightly older version if you wanted to keep some of the, um, the if some, something changed that you didn't like in the interface for that, for some reason, uh, you can stay on an older version as well. So I wanted to show that in the capture app, which is also on continuous release and has been for quite some time. Okay, so with that, I think I'm going to switch over to my colleague, Brian, who's actually not in the, in the um, call here today. So I'm gonna see if I can get him on the phone, see if we can call him in here. Let's see, go ahead and give him a ring. Brian, are you there? Oh. Hi, can you hear me now? It's Brian. Outreach nerd, and I'm going to install my DHIS2 application. Um, this is actually my not my first time uh, putting it on, but I'm uh, just going to log in here really quickly. And while I'm logging in, just going to be waiting for the authentication to happen. And yes, I actually do want to help improve this app. This is something that everyone should be doing. And you can send some notifications about it, syncing configuration. And uh, while I'm doing that, just thinking about what I have to do today, some other things. This is a big part of uh, being an outreach nurse is just waiting. <laughs> but as I sync my configuration, I can, also, um, I can also plan out my route for the day and where I'm going to be going. Um, so this will be first, my configuration is ready. But I also see that I have a software update that's uh, available to download right now. So I'm going to download the software update. And I will say, yes, please, uh, please allow from this source. And then I will go back. Will in the background of the application, it will be, uh, yes, I will, oh, problem parsing this one, that's fine. So uh, I'm just going to open up the child program here. And then I'm going to see who I have to find today. So I'm going to open up my, my filter here. I'm going to go to my visits today. And I'm gonna to see here that I have Joelle and Martin that I need to go visit. So when I go back to my, my list here, I can see that there's also a maps icon at the bottom. So I'm going to just quickly uh, check out this map. And yes, I will allow location while using this app. And I can see as I zoom in here that actually, they're both pretty close by to me. So who do I have here? I have Joelle and I have Maria and Martin. So first I'm just going to uh, select Martin here. And then I'm going to say, oh, I want to go find how to find Martin. So I'm going to open up the maps application here. And while it finds Martin, it's also going to give me directions for how to find where this house is located. So I'm going to ask it to give me uh, directions in Google Maps for how to get there. And it turns out they're pretty close by because they're just in the auditorium over here. So we're just to walk over here. Usually I have my bicycle for this part, but not today. Hey. Was there a Martin here? You look like Martin. Okay. 
Well, I'm going to ask you some questions about your baby now. I hope you don't mind with this uh, live studio audience and everything. So I'm just going to click on Martin's name in the card here. And now we'll go through the baby postnatal visits. So I'll enter in the report date. Um, how fat is your baby? Uh, what kind of fat? In grams, like... Um, 780. 785. <laughs> yeah, metric system is tough. Huh? Um, breastfeeding? Um, no. No, no <laughs> breastfeeding. Okay. Yeah, uh, replacement. Okay. Um, measles? No, no, no measles, uh, but you've received a dose for it, right? Yes. Yes, okay, okay. No anti-vaxxers here, we're good with that. Um, okay. Yellow fever dose, also good. I'm gonna give you a vitamin A supplement, yep. Uh, childhood ARVs, nope, not, not for us right now. I'm actually really happy to tell you, Martin, that uh, we have uh, your HIV test results for your child. I hope Yeah, so. <laughs> that, that it comes from the PCR and they are negative. Hey. Yeah. So I'm just going to ask you to add your signature right there, if you could. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. <All> right. <laughs> You're an artist. <laughs> so we're just going to save that up there. And now just save the event. And that's uh, the last visit I had today. So thank you, Martin slash Vlad. <laughs> Now, that's not the last thing that I had to do today. That was my last outreach visit because now I'm going to plan my subsequent day and the next work that I have to do. So um, I'm going to swap over to the Capture app. Can, oops, whoops. Can you see the screen here? Might take a while. Yep. So in the Capture app, I'm actually going to already have this uh, child program and my registration unit up here. And you can see the list of all of the different uh, registered um, patients here and the child program that I have to follow up and see. But I have a, a custom working list here for just children who are low birth weight in a supplemental feeding program. So that could not be loaded for right now. Um, so I will also, maybe it's because, ah, there we are. It's always clear cash or not logged in. So I'm just going to go back to the capture app. Oops. Capture. And then again, choose a child program, Meglahoon CHC, and click low birth weight. So now we can see that um, it's pre-selected for me. The date of enrollment is in the last uh, three months or last 90 days. Uh, the program stage was at birth and the weight was less than 2,500 and it had a uh, mixture replacement uh, feeding in the child health program. So now I can see that these are individual uh, children that I should be following up with tomorrow. Um, but it's not the, the last job that I have to do. Uh, my work is not complete until it's all documented. So uh, a part of my job as well is that um, I have to find my uh, facility tally sheet uh, for mortality and statistics. So I'm just going to enter into the data entry app here. Fortunately, these are all the children under five. And say month that it occurred. So at one case, acute classic paralysis. Uh, no rabies, no cholera, uh, some malaria, measles, meningitis, no plague, thankfully, uh, and some no rabies, typhus, et cetera, et cetera. So once I enter in all of these here, uh, yellow fever one, once I enter this, then I can... Um, run validation and see what the alerts are, that there's a high number of yellow fever and meningitis cases here. Um, but then I will also mark it complete and that's my day for today. So hopefully someone will give me good feedback on the data that I have uh, collected and we can improve our health programs from here. Thank you, Nurse Brian.
now we're back uh, at the system administration level. So I'm, I'm pulling that up now. Hopefully we can get it on the screen. Okay, great. So we were, we were just here. Um, I forgot to demonstrate the actual uploading of the application to install the version. So I uh, am omniscient, but I don't. Uh, uh, I do get impatient and, and skip some things sometimes. So I will, <laughs> will demonstrate uh, just here quickly that you have a version of the Android Capture application that you can upload uh, in this APK distribution app. And so this will allow you to specify the versions of the Android application that the users in your system will get notified about, uh, which is a, a very uh, a useful feature, I think. Uh, we saw the, the uh, update notification that um, Brian got when he was out in the field. So the last thing I'm going to demonstrate here as well is uh, the uh, data exchange application. So we just saw some data come in through a tracker program, which is individual level data. Um, but sometimes you want to aggregate that and put it into the aggregate data model, either within this DHIS2 instance itself. So moving it from a program indicator or a program data in the program to a, um, a number in the aggregate data model. Uh, or potentially to send it to an external system. Maybe you have a tracker system and you want to set to aggregate your tracker data and send it to the HMIS. This is something that can now be done using the data exchange service and the data exchange application. So I actually have already configured one of these um, uh, exchanges. And here I can see what data will be sent or will be aggregated. So this is taking tracker data and it's sending it to an aggregate data element. Um, I have the, the number of OQV3 doses given in uh, each of the chiefdoms in, the, um, uh, in Sierra Leone in this case. Um, so you can actually go through and review all of this data manually. Um, you can also schedule this so that uh, I could schedule this so that it would run nightly, for example, or run after um, maybe maybe once a month, I want to send my tracker data to HMIS or to uh, a, um, another repository somewhere. And once I've reviewed this and made sure that it's okay, um, I'm going to click submit. So it asks me to confirm what data I'm submitting. Again, in this case, we're doing an internal data exchange. So we're actually aggregating the tracker data within this DHS2 system and putting it into the data elements uh, in the aggregate model within the same system. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And it's going to submit. And it will show that, in this case, uh, this data was already created, but I've updated all of those data values for the aggregation of the individual level data over the last 12 months. And that's now in the aggregate data model. And I can use all of my visualization tools. Uh, I can correlate that with other data in my HMIS uh, without needing to query the individual level data directly using a program indicator, for example. Now we're going to go back to uh, someone who's doing a little bit of analytics on this system. So with that, I would like to introduce our district health officer, Vito, to come up on to her office and, and demonstrate a little bit uh, how to use the data that we've collected in the field and how to um, use that uh, at the district or the national level. Vito. Yeah, no, Brian, uh, no, fantastic job, but um, I heard you, you, what are you doing in, uh, in, in surgery? Um, what do you mean they lost the register? Um, no, 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 it's, it's okay, it's okay, Look, just, just try to find it. Um, yeah, no, no, I, is it it? No, don't, don't pass it, no, Brian, 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 no, don't pass him, Brian, no, no. Brian, Brian, you're fine. Yay! Hi, no, it's fantastic. Fantastic to hear from you. No, lovely. Um, yet yeah, no, every day I check. Yes, yes, every they enter weekly. Yes, I check every day to check that they don't enter more often, actually. Yes, yes, um, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, no, we're doing great, actually. Yeah, 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 I I'll keep you updated. Thank you, thank you, cheers. I have not entered or checked data in months, probably. Um, sure. Oh, okay. So, thankfully, I actually like follow a little bit what my admin tells me. Um, but let's check a little bit. Yeah, that's actually 
let, let's follow what admin says. Um, okay, so I have here my data that I had done a while ago. Um, it's not found, that's fantastic. Oh, there you go, there you go. Okay, so I had to check some some immunization data because that's supposed to be my job normally. Um, um, got my glasses, but it's okay. <sighs> Actually, I forgot my glasses. <laughs> Actually, my glasses are there because the demo is gone. <laughs> okay, so I have my OPV because we're doing great apparently. So I have some deaths here and I've heard that they were doing already some calculations, so I might add it there. But unfortunately, they told me that I don't have anything on coverage. So let's just, just very quickly. Oh, the pressure. Uh, how do you do it? Um, I think I have to have OPV data. So that one. I know, but wait. And then, of course, for coverage, you need a population under five. There you go, there you go. That's a good one. And then times 100. And then I call it, let me check the formula because you never know. All right. Um, and then OPV3 coverage. Okay. And I save it and then I update it as well. So yeah, I should have everything there. So how do we even have high coverage that we have children? We need to find out, but uh, doing great, doing great, not doing amazing. Yeah. Um, okay. Just, just let me quickly check what's going on here. Um, so let me remove that. Let me remove that. And um, I think we should go down there. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Um, let's do quarters since it's been a while, haven't you? Actually, not fairness. Um, okay. And let me check if I can do something like that because I've heard that I can actually, I can actually change it. Yeah, no, no, it doesn't work like that. No. Mm, there you go, there you go. And I heard that I can actually change and do it properly. All right, we're not doing amazing, but we can get there. Um, better than last year, though, nonetheless. Um, okay, we might have a problem here. Okay, just let me save it a little second. Okay, let me go here. Got to love when they change all the icons. Um, okay, so we're doing great here. Um, okay, so actually something that I have to thank admin again, remind me later, the line list, because I knew that something was dodgy here. Ah, oh, there you go, there you go. And then uh, the OPV3 coverage. Oh. You want me? Mm. There you go. I can't find it as usual. Oh, whatever. I'm gonna tell Brian to add it. Um. Okay. So I'm actually going to call Brian just a second because it looks like we have some work to do.
Ryan, so yeah, yeah, I already told you to get out of there. Um, what do you mean they lost the surgeon now? No, no, get out, get out. Oh, we need to like schedule some more visits. Just get out of there already. We need to talk. Thank you very much to Vito and Brian, our two actors today. Big round of applause. We had a volunteer from the audience as well, who was a, a very proud father. <laughs> and I wanna say thank you also to Marta Vila and Grant, who did a great job putting all of this together. It was a little bit last minute, but we're, we're excited to try something, try something a little bit different to, to weave the different features together. So thank you to Marta and Grant. And with that, I think we are done for the morning and we are moving on to lunch. So is there a, an announcement before we move to lunch? Thank you everyone for your attention and for joining us on this journey through DHS2. So we we're going we're going across the across the courtyard here to lunch. So follow follow some of your helpful UIO staff who I'm sure are going to be leading the way, um, and bring your badge. You you don't get to eat unless you have a badge. So make sure you bring your badge, um, and there'll be instructions waiting for you on the other side. Thank you all very much. Thank <laughs> you.